Just like a Ferrari, every part of BigQuery was designed to make your queries run fast. And that includes BigQuery's managed storage. In today's episode, we're going under the hood to figure out exactly how BigQuery stores this data so that you can make informed decisions on how to optimize your BigQuery storage. When talking about BigQuery storage, there are a few things I always like to point out. First off, BigQuery offers fully managed storage, meaning you don't have to worry about provisioning servers or worry about configuring any hardware. All sizing is done automatically, and you only pay for what you use. Next, BigQuery uses what we call Columnar Data Store. Taking a step back for a moment, traditional relational databases like Postgres and MySQL store data row by row in record-oriented storage. This makes them really good at transactional updates. For example, changing the status of an order because they only need to open up a single row to read or write data. However, if you want to perform an aggregation, like summing up the sale price column to get your total revenue, you would need to read the entire table into memory. BigQuery, on the other hand, uses columnar storage, where data is co-located by column rather than row. This makes BigQuery an ideal solution for analytical use cases. Now, to calculate the total revenue, BigQuery will only need to read in the sale price column. Internally, BigQuery stores data in a proprietary columnar format called capacitor. One really cool thing about Capacitor is that it uses relevant factors like the type of data and how the data is being used to reshuffle rows and encode columns. One example is run length encoding. Let's pretend that the value one appears three times in a row in your data. Rather than storing one, 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 Capacitor can instead store one, three. But what if the rows are ordered such that there are no long runs of the same value? Well, to solve this, Capacitor simply reorders the rows to obtain a compact encoding. So now we know about BigQuery's file format. But where do these files actually get saved? The persistence layer for BigQuery is provided by the distributed file system throughout Google, Colossus. Colossus has a ton of disks that live on a ton of servers. But when you have so many, chances are that dozens of disks are going to fail each day. So the goal is to make sure that no data is lost. Colossus ensures durability by using something called erasure encoding, which breaks data into fragments and saves redundant pieces across a set of different disks. However, to ensure the data is both durable and available, the data is also replicated to another availability zone within the same region that was designated when you created your data set. This means data is saved in a bunch of different buildings that has a different power system and network. The chances of multiple availability zones going offline at once is very small. But if you use multi-region locations like the US or the EU, BigQuery stores another copy of the data in an off-region replica. That way, the data is recoverable in the event of a major disaster. Aside from replication, Colossus also protects your data by ensuring that it is 100% encrypted at rest. Plus, if you want to control encryption yourself, you can use customer-managed encryption keys. And the great thing about all of this is that encoding, encryption, and replication are included in the price of BigQuery storage, so no hidden costs. So far, we've talked about the format in which BigQuery stores data, and we've talked about the physical file system where the data is stored. But how do we ensure that data is stored in a way that makes our queries as performant as possible? BigQuery has a storage optimizer that helps arrange data into the optimal shape for querying by periodically rewriting files. Files may be written first in a format that is fast to write to, but later BigQuery will format them in a way that's fast to query. Aside from the optimization happening behind the scenes, there are also a few things that you can do to further enhance storage. First off, 
BigQuery allows you to partition your table when it's created. Partitioning basically allows you to divide large tables into smaller chunks or partitions, which are stored in a physically separate location. When you include a WHERE clause in your query, BigQuery will only need to read in the partitions that you actually need. BigQuery allows you to partition data based on the time it was ingested, a date column with granularity as low as hourly, or an integer column. When deciding on partitions, you should consider how people at your organization are using this data. For example, if data consumers are most often looking at orders placed in the past week, it might make sense to partition your table by order date so that you can efficiently read data just from the past seven days. Partitions are designed for places where there is a large amount of data and a low number of distinct values. A good rule of thumb is making sure partitions are greater than one gigabyte. If you over partition your tables, you'll create a lot of metadata, which means that reading in lots of partitions may actually slow down your query. If you need higher cardinality or you have a smaller table, you should use clustering. Clustering is like sorting your tables on a particular set of columns. For example, clustering our table by customer ID would sort the rows based on the customer ID. In BigQuery, you're able to choose up to four columns to cluster on. This allows for efficient lookups because the query engine needs to open files that have the cluster key. For example, if we query our table and include a filter to only look at orders placed by customer number one, then we only need to open up this file. The tricky part of clustering is maintaining the clusters when the data is changing. But BigQuery solves this by periodically reclustering each table. This happens automatically without any user intervention or additional cost. Partitioning and clustering are often used together. We can partition by the low cardinality field, for example, the created date of the order, and cluster by the high cardinality one, like customer ID. This lets you operate over a date range slice of the table but it also lets you find records from a particular customer without having to scan all the data in the partition. As with partitioning, you should always try and figure out the types of questions users will be asking of the data to decide the keys that you'll use to cluster. Want to learn more about storage optimization? Check out the links below. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of BigQuery Spotlight. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel on YouTube for other great content. Look out for our next episode of BigQuery Spotlight, and remember, stay curious.